Hey, so welcome back to Thriving on Mission. And we are here for another episode amidst the global pandemic. And as always, I'm Matt Rogi, the show's host. And with me is Quinn Harris. Hey, hey, everybody. How's it going, Quinn? Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Just trying to social distance as much as possible. That's right. And, yeah. yeah. Be the responsible citizen and, you know, and still get things taken care of. Yeah. So, which for some things is easier than others. But yeah. My wife had gone to the store today and, and she was out shopping. I mean, for the most part, at least here in Savannah, things were pretty normal. Yeah. You know, no issues whatsoever. She went last week and had to stand outside of Walmart because they were only letting certain people mm. in. But when she went today, I guess they're still doing that, but there wasn't, they weren't at capacity. Yeah. I haven't ran into, I've ran into like the line things that they've made out of buggies or whatever mm -hmm. uh, to get in and out of Walmart, but I haven't, I haven't seen the, the quantity thing actually enacted yet trying to go there so gotcha but of course you know i'm sure you've seen all the pictures uh of you know the guy on his phone with the glove in his mouth and the other dude yeah. in line eating the <laughs> eating the doritos that's the, right yeah. you're like what? Yeah. what is going on yeah. so sometimes you question you know whether humanity is going to be able to survive when you yeah. see those photos but yeah yeah so yeah, uh, so this week I was reading and just, this is more just trivial information. You might've seen it. Listeners have probably might've seen this as well, but talking about in Yosemite National Park and because of, and that's in California and because of the stay at home order, uh, National Park, it's closed. Mm -hmm. And within Yosemite Valley uh, and the whole park, there, there's only a small group of people that are still there, basically caretakers, some rangers, there are some people who uh, provide meals for all these people. And I think they said within Yosemite, about 200 people. And the interesting thing is all the wildlife. While it hasn't necessarily, it hasn't multiplied. I mean, we've only been doing this for like a month and a half. Yeah. But the fact that there's no people around, the wildlife is coming into places to where they normally aren't. And so the people that are there are seeing, you know, bears, you know, more bear sightings than you've ever would have seen before yeah. and just all the different wildlife running around. Um, you know, and they, say, and they say that's pretty cool. Um, you know, and the other thing I was, as I was reading about this, they had said that, you know, Yosemite Valley, the whole park, I mean, it's virus free, yeah. but every now and then they still have people that come in from the outside, like yeah. delivery trucks. And I guess there's actually a, a few right on the edges of the park. There's some private homes, and so sometimes those people will come into the store and so they still have to practice the social distancing yeah. and that type of stuff. But, you know, it's someplace that they know that the virus is not there just because they've been in isolation for so long. Yeah. We were talking about it a little bit beforehand, but uh, if you ever get a chance to look up the wildlife at Chernobyl, um, since that whole area oh, has yeah. been shut down, it's, they have some beautiful pictures of, uh, you know, like foxes and all this stuff that, you know, wasn't there all the wildlife is really, you know, flourishing over there, you know, since there's been no people. Right. There for so right. Long. You know, you can do a tour there. Yeah. I want to go really bad. Both. I guess they have both legal tours at the government mm -hmm. sanctions and they also have some people that will do some underground, literally underground tours. Yeah. Um, that'll take you to different spots. And yeah, I, uh, I saw a video of, you know, there's still the hot, some of those hospitals, they, through everybody's belongings into like the basements of them. Right. Yeah. And so there's still some that have crazy, like off the chart radiation readings, just the clothes that they oh, go wow. down there and read it. Yeah. Wow. That's spooky. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So the Yosemite thing is interesting to you because this morning as uh, my wife and I, we were getting up and I was going into the kitchen and looking out the window blinds and I was like, what is that? A cat in our backyard? And it wasn't a cat. It was a possum. Yeah. And the possum was going up to drink some water from this little area we have for the birds. And immediately I was like, Stacy, quick, come here, you know? And so she sees the possum and we're like, what's a possum doing out during the daytime? And so our cats see the possum. And then she goes and looks out the other window and there's another possum. There's like a pair of possums in our backyard. And so she went outside, she took some photos and some video, but I guess, you know, again, it's funny because things like that, like possums and even deer, you think about with the, amount of people that aren't driving armadillos yeah. you know the big thing here in the south right 
is that population will start to get more and more because there's less cars on the road. Yeah, for sure. You know, so yeah. we're going to have this overpopulation of possums, armadillo, and deer here in yeah. Kibble Mutts. Yeah. So I've got to watch out for that. Yeah. So I'll see if I can find a picture and I'll post it to you. Yeah, be cool. Of our possums. It'd be cool. Photo of our possums. I want to name them too. So the rosy family possums. <laughs> Get a little GoPro out there yeah. and set up a little live cam with yeah. the possums and that'd be hilarious. You know that would be funny. So, all right. So hey, so uh, what I wanted to talk about this week was it was a book that I read. It was probably about a year ago. Uh, this book it's called Make Your Bed: Little Things That Can Change Your Life and Maybe the World, and it was written by. Admiral William McRaven, and he's retired now. And this book came out of a commencement speech he did in 2014 at University of Texas. And it was basically to the graduating seniors, hey, they're getting ready to go into the world. And, um, and the whole premise was, you know, just make your bed. And out of that, then he wrote this book. And it's basically 10 things that are, that are these little simple, 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 not simple, simple uh, thoughts, if you will, yeah. of, you know, you could call it how to win at life, how to, how to thrive, not just survive, how to overcome difficulties, things like that. And it's a short little book. Uh, you know, you could call it a coffee table book. It's probably, I bet you it's no more than 150 pages. You yeah. can read in a couple of nights, but, and he's got 10 things in there. And so I just wanted to talk about those, especially just in light of, again, the situation we're in, because it's very relevant into a lot of things that people are facing, especially mentally right now. Yeah, for sure. Now, did you share that speech on Facebook or anything recently? I've mm -hmm. seen, I saw that within the last no, week. No, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ran into it okay. somewhere yeah. within the last week. Yeah, though. yeah. I mean, it, it was, it, it went viral when it came out. And yeah. Um, you know, you can find it on YouTube. And in fact, I'll put a link to that with the show notes as well into the book. Um, you know, for people that don't know, Admiral McRaven, he was a Navy SEAL. And basically he had been there, done that. Um, he, when I had a chance to meet him and work for him a little bit, he was uh, a one-star Admiral and he eventually retired as a four-star Admiral. But, um, and that was back in 2005 when I met him and had a chance to work for him. But he was probably more, most famous for the fact that he was the commander of JSOC in 2011 when they did the uh, Osama bin Laden mission. And so he was the one that oversaw that whole thing. And, oh, cool. Um, but, you know, from the small interaction that I had with him, and, and which I think is, um, you can see it in his speech, you can see it in this book. And, um, and also he wrote, he just finished another book. He's just an incredible man. Yeah. And... You know, he reminded me a lot of, you know, if you think about the quintessential grandfather in a way, but at the same time, you know, he could also like probably like kill you with his pinky yeah. type of guy, yeah. you know? Um, so funny thing about, you know, when I had a chance to meet him, it was over in Afghanistan and uh, in his other book, he talks about this as well. He talks about um, that he, even when he became a commander and a higher ranking officer, he would still like to go out on the missions with the guys, uh, partly just because he enjoyed it. He enjoyed being on the ground with Rangers or Navy SEALs um, or flying in the helicopters with us, you know, and and just to stay in touch, yeah. you know, because you can lose reality as you get higher and higher in leadership. And obviously there's risk associated with that too. Yeah, you know, sure. you're, you're taking a one-star admiral onto an objective where you know, people got bad guys with guns and stuff like that. But, you know, he would still do that. And, you know, the things that I'd heard were when he would do that, you know, he never, he was never in command. Was, I mean, he was, but as far as like the guy on the ground making tactical decisions, you know, he would say, hey, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be back here. I'm not gonna, yeah. you know, but he would go in with a weapon and everything. And I met him because in 2005, he flew with us on a mission and he was in, he wasn't in my aircraft. I was the lead aircraft, and he was in the jump seat of our of Chalk Two with my friend Mike. And it was during we were going to pick up a team of Green Berets, and we'd put him in a few nights earlier up in the mountains of Afghanistan and the Konar Valley. And we went to go pick him up. Um, that was when I had my accident, and so <clears throat> the interesting 
thing was, is he was on the second aircraft, you know, when we crashed. And you can imagine some of the chaos with radio communications and this and that, the people back at headquarters in, in the, the, the JOC, the Joint Operational Command Center, they were freaking out because they didn't yeah. know which aircraft actually crashed at that point. And, then, yeah. and they were obviously, they were worried about all of us. However, he warranted a little more worry and I get it. Yeah. You know, he was re um, you know, responsible for a lot of things. And, uh, but my friend, Mike, he tells the story because again, he's, you know, they see the glow, they see the fireball come up and they don't know what's going on. And Mike is frantically on the radios trying to coordinate and figure out what's going on and, you know, how we are and what can he do right now. And he said at some point during the first few minutes of this event occurring, he says that Admiral McRaven sort of, you know, leaned forward a little bit in the cockpit, being between the two pilots, put his hands on the pilot's shoulders and said, hey guys, just so you know, just when you get a chance, let the guys back in Bagram know that I'm okay. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, you stay out here until you do what needs to be done. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't take me back because they say you got to bring me back. Yeah. You're basically saying, hey, mission's first. Yeah. I'm not that important. Yeah. What's important are the guys on the ground. And I appreciated hearing that story. Um, and then I, had, I actually had a chance to sit down with them a few days later because, you know, that accident was, was and I talked about it, I think, during the interview that I did with Nick. It shook us up pretty good, everybody on the crew, you know, and all of us, you know, we walked away from death and um, a lot of us were reconsidering our careers in flying. Yeah. Understandable. And there was, you know, and again, our commanders, you know, at the time they were also encouraging us, though, to get back out and fly, get back on the horse, that metaphor. And so... I guess the Admiral had asked how the crew was doing and that was relayed to him. He's like, well, hey, why don't you have him just come up to my office for a little bit? I'll just sit down and talk with him. And it wasn't to say, hey, finger in the chest, you need to get back out there. It was like being around your grandpa. Yeah. And so he brought us in, into his office and, you know, and it was a plywood building, like all the buildings were over in Afghanistan for us. And he sits us down on the couch and introduces himself and you know, gets around and how's everybody doing. And, and basically he just told us a couple of stories of times to where he almost died yeah. and just talked about his struggles and his thought process of getting back out there. And a lot of it, you know, as I reflect back on that conversation, a lot of the things he told us were one of these 10 things that he put in his book because he talked about when he was um, a younger officer in the Navy as a Navy SEAL that he had a parachute malfunction and, um, and basically broke almost every bone in his body. Wow. And they never thought he was going to be able to be operational again. This was right before nine 11 happened. And, you know, but he wanted to recover from that. Um, you know, but just talked about that going back out there and jumping again after going through that experience. Yeah. And then he talked about another experience to where he was in one of their boats in heavy seas and the boat got flipped and he was stuck underneath the boat and thought he was going to drown. And again, just the fear, the, you know, the traumatic event and the things, you know, but I really appreciated the fact that he took the time to talk, to sit down and talk to, you know, the crew yeah. and basically to say, Hey, look, man, I've been where you are. I know exactly what you're going through, you know, and you have my sympathy, my empathy for that too, but there is a path forward, you know, and so I really appreciated that from him. So when I saw this book came out and I read it, I was like, wow, that's pretty, pretty neat because he does go into these things that allow you to step forward from adversity. Yeah. Maybe this is a silly question. So whenever you're serving, are there guys like him that you hear about kind of thing? Like, are there like legends within the different branches of the military or anything like that like is this someone that you that you would have heard about no you know okay no i mean i i knew who he was just because he was in our chain of command yeah. but as far as like stories that you hear about you know you don't hear those stories until after the fact so like you know usually like long after the fact yeah um you know and it, usually it's when they have stopped serving is when people will talk about him a little bit more but uh but there were some other guys you know like in the 160th there were still pilots on active duty who were in Mogadishu in 90, 
in yeah. the 90s, you know, and these are guys that did absolutely heroic things. Yeah. And, you know, after you're in the unit a while and you ran across them, people would say, oh, hey, that's that's Carl, you know, yeah. he's Silver yeah. Star. He did that. And you're just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. OK. You know, that's what that's what I was. Curious yeah. About. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So things like, yeah. Um, does occur. So, yeah. Um, so he retired. And he actually went to University of Texas. He was the chancellor for a while, but I guess I just read too. I didn't know this. Um, he stepped down that position just for spend some more time with his family. So, and I think some health stuff too. But so I'm just going to briefly, we're just going to, I just want to run through these things and maybe we can sort of apply what that might look like right now for some people. And, yeah. and I'll share some of my experiences. But the first one he talks about is start your day with the task completed. And that sort of goes back to the title of the book, Make Your Bed. And, you know, I think that comes from the military aspect of it. I mean, that's usually, you know, especially as a young soldier and, you know, that's got to make your bed as soon as you get up. Otherwise, somebody's going to yell at you. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it's interesting because the idea is I'm going to accomplish one thing today, whatever it might be, but I'm going to accomplish it. And it's going to be the first thing that I do. Yeah. I, I can at least say, no matter how bad the rest of the day is going to be. I did something, yeah. you know? So my wife and I, she read the book too. And, um, which I'm not, sort. it surprised me that, that she enjoyed it as much as she did. Because now it's, you know, like when we get up in the mornings, we'll say, all right, you know, and we're pretty good about, we'll both get up around the same time. And, and she'll say, you know, all right, what are we gonna do now? Just make the bed. Yeah. And, you know, we can at least say, hey, regardless of everything else, the bed get bed got made. So do you start your day off with one thing every morning? Oh, you know, making my bed sometimes. It doesn't uh, have to be that. Yeah, it just you depends. Know? Yeah. Because some, um, I mean, I get it. Yeah. Why make it if you're going to get back in it? Yeah. Uh, no, nah, I mean, nothing really in particular, but I, I do understand for sure the, uh, you know, the, the benefit of doing it. I mean, the listeners may not know, but I've, I've been, you know, through multiple addiction recovery, mm -hmm. uh, programs and such. And that is always rule number one, whenever it comes to your area, always make sure your bed's made. Right. You know? And so, I mean, I, I get it, you know, sure, he sure. even says it in the original, you know, speech that, you know, hopefully the idea is that completing this first task, the satisfaction that you get from it will motivate you to go to the next and then right. the next and the next. And it doesn't always work like that, but sure. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just a way I, I'm one of those guys that like, I hate how my mouth tastes like all the time. Yep. So I, you know, as many times, if I get in bed, if I get up to pee four times during the night, I brush my teeth every time. Right. So <laughs> that's the first thing I'm doing every time. You gotcha. Know? Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and like you said, it can build from that point forward. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's a mental game. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. It is. And, right. you know, start your day with the task completed. Um, so the next one is you can't go it, you can't go at it alone. And I think you know, we can both relate to that from our stories, yeah, right? For sure. Um, you know, from addiction standpoint, from, you know, for you and from, you know, with post-traumatic stress and, but just even as a human, right? Of, of this idea of, and, you know, as Christians as well, you know, we're not designed, we're not made to do things in isolation. Yeah. Which is the hardest thing right now. Yeah, for sure. You know, this idea that, um, the only interaction we can get with people for the most part is via Zoom. And I just read there's a new, you know, Zoom burnout. Psychologists are calling it like the next, you know, something or other, I guess, you know. Yeah. Um, but that idea that, you know, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to to lean on each other and to be able to have those types of relationships with people. Yeah which is pretty foreign, I think, to most people. Yeah, I think so too. Um, support is just extremely helpful, you know, for sure. And uh, it's, uh, it is one of those things to where like, depending on what situation that you're in, like uh, 
for mine, for instance, and I would imagine that on some level yours as well, like I have to, it, it is a decision that I have to make on my own to, you know, I'm not going to sit here and wallow in my past today, or I'm not going to let the mm-hmm. way that I'm feeling, you know, dictate what happens to me today or, or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, support is, support is, is definitely crucial. Yeah. Really, no matter what journey. I mean, it's, it, it's really funny that you bring up the quarantine thing too. You know, we do the, Enne- we do the Enneagram thing and elements test here. And it's, there are some people that, uh, you know, really bank on those things. Right. Like, like I'm, <laughs> I'm not one of them, you know, I, mm-hmm. going through like AA and trying that stuff out, you know, all that, I would rather not be, you know, my identity to be a wind or a whatever. Right. But it's, I, I get it. And sure. It's, you know, but the people that are big into it are usually extroverts and it's, it's been funny watching them squirm during this whole thing. <laughs> you know, it has been. That's funny. Yeah. I'm a five, by the way. Uh, what are you? Do you remember? Uh, my heavy is a negative one. Eight, maybe. Okay. My, yeah, that's an and, and eight is like a, uh, strong leader. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what they all are, but I, I don't either. It, in the elements thing, I'm uh fire. Okay. Like you know, strictly. So I haven't heard of that one. It's the same concept. You get like uh water, wind, fire, earth. yeah, earth kind of thing. And so most people have some mix of both. I'm actually stubborn in whatever you know <laughs> thing that it. Yeah. Okay. So. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, so that was the first, so stay, start your day with a task completed. You can't go at it alone. And then the next one is only the size of your heart matters. And, uh, and I definitely, you know, get what he's saying, you know, especially in this one's in reference to, you know, doing stuff in the military and he relates it to his times of going through SEAL training, which, you know, I think most people in America, you have to sleep under a rock to not have heard something about that. Yeah. You know, and just that idea of, you know, the willingness to, the grit, determination. And well, you know, you talked about it just a second ago when you said we have to make a choice whether, or, you know, am I going to stay home and wallow in my pity? Or am I going to take an active step, you know, to show heart, to show grit, determination, things like that. Um, And that's going to look different from everybody, Mm. you know, in a lot of ways. Um, This fourth one, is life's not fair, drive on. And you know, I think about this, especially with the commencement speech, and I can't remember if he actually talked about this one in the commencement speech, but you know, especially with social media, everybody has a voice now. And you know, if you, if you think that something is unfair, you can say, hey, you know, it's not fair. I mean, yeah. we see that right now with the whole economic stimulus packages and, you know, it's not fair for these people to get this and not fair for these people to get that, that type of stuff. But, you know, I think his point is, is yeah, acknowledge, Hey, it's not fair. Um, Whatever it might be. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily ignore it, but if you let that occupy your thoughts, yeah, you know, and so just acknowledge it, do what you can about it, but don't let it become this self-absorbing creature yeah. that takes over your whole thought process yeah. and move on. Yeah. That's one of the things that I struggle with the most, you know, it really is. It's a daily thing for me a lot. You know, just I have to constantly remind myself, like whatever relief that like, even if I get the relief from, you know, explaining to this person where they're wrong or, you know, mm-hmm. why, this shouldn't have happened to me or why, you know, like it's typically it's not worth, it's not worth it. And it's not going to fix it. Right. You know, so it's better to just move on. Yeah. It's a hard one. Yeah. That's why it's a hard one for for sure. Definitely. Um, You know, which leads into this idea. He says his fifth one is failure can make you stronger. And I think, you know, as, as Christians, we recognize immediately where that comes from. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that, that's a constant theme that we see that Jesus talks about, right? You know, the fact that, you know, suffering, and Paul writes about it, right? Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Yeah. 
which is going to make you stronger. Yeah. And, um, and again, it's, it's the idea of making a choice. And again, we all have choices to make right now in our minds of how we're going to look at a situation and, and in a failure, we can wallow in it. We can let it consume us. We can let it affect our thoughts in a negative way. Yeah. That doesn't mean that if I do the opposite, it's going to be any more fun. You know, whatever failure it is, maybe it's economic failure right now for somebody, maybe their business. We were talking about that earlier about small businesses and, you know, um, just by saying, you know, going, well, hey, this is going to make me stronger. The fact that my business failed, obviously that it's not a magic pill. Yeah. But there is truth to that as well if you let it, yeah. you know. Um, you ever failed at anything? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I was going to say my, like the, you know, the road to recovery that I take is one that, uh, I built off of the ones that I found out, you know, didn't work for me or that I didn't respond well to, Right. you know, so it's, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it does in the long run, it's hard to see a lot of times, Sure. you know, right whenever that stuff happens, but you know, yeah, it, yeah. It, if you'd have told me you know, whenever I was doing AA, whenever I relapsed or whenever I was doing, you know, such and such other program and relapse that eventually like I would learn from, from that and learn what I did wrong, you know, with those curriculums and with those programs and stuff, you know, that those things would eventually allow me to form my own thing. You yeah. know, it, I wouldn't have believed you, but it, you know, mm -hmm. it does, it does do it in the long run. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think I went through two or three iterations of some type of step program with the VA yeah. for the counseling. And I would get six, seven, five, maybe sessions into it. And I would just, I'd quit. Yeah. It was hard. And, um, but I'm thankful the fact that I didn't stop there. Right. You know, cause you're, like you said, it was all right, well, let me try this. Let me try that. Let me try this civilian psychologist let me try this counselor yeah. you know to where i was able to finally you know get to a point to where oh yeah. this is working this antidepressant and then you know it's not working and the doctor never checks on you and right and you get put on another one it's yeah yeah it's the worst man you know uh, an interesting one he puts next it says you must dare greatly so after failure can make you stronger you must dare greatly and he's alluding to the fact of taking risks. Yeah. Uh, and that's real hard to do right now, I think for everybody, yeah. because we don't know what the next, what's going to be like a year from now, yeah. you know, um, you know, from a couple episodes ago talking about, you know, being resilient. Cause again, we don't know what this year is going to look like. And so what's this idea? You want me to take risks yeah. and, um, it's gotta be measured, I think. And I don't even know what that looks like right now, to be honest. What would that look like? Um, you know, to dare greatly in this in this environment, you know, especially you know if you talk <clears throat> again economically. Yeah. Boy, that's that's a hard one oh, for yeah. people. Oh yeah. You know, um, you know, I think you know on a more personal, practical level, you can probably do some more things, but you know. But it's hard to, and again, because people are like, uh, you know, it's almost, you know, you're rallying the wagons around you. You want to put up the walls around your castle and, you know, sort of huddle in right now because it's, you don't know what's going to come. But I can also see, you know, well, just like doing this podcast, continuing to do this podcast, it's, you know, I've, I've read, you know, generally podcast viewership is down across the board just because, People aren't driving as much. They aren't in subways and where they normally listen to podcasts, no. you know, the majority. And so, um, you know, so, all right, well, that's okay. Just, we've talked about this before because you have your own podcast. The church has a couple, um, you know, that idea that, all right, well, I mean, if you're still having fun and doing it, don't let that affect, yeah. don't let viewership affect yeah. whether you're going to do this or not. Just take a risk, put yourself out there. Yeah. yeah. If you're consistent, people will see it, you know, yeah. eventually. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Sometimes it takes a long time. Yeah. You know, 
but even right now, even small risks, like we were talking about earlier, like I, I desperately need a computer that, that video editing is, doesn't touch, right? you know, because as of right now, like I have all these nice gaming gear, but you know, after I've edited on it for 60 hours, <laughs> like it's, that puts a toll on this stuff. And yeah. So it's, you know, that's a thousand bucks, but like with or without the stimulus check, I have the thousand dollars, but you know, I have to weigh how, like what's the risk factor there, you know, like right. get this new laptop, which I do need and risk not having rent or, yeah. you know, continue to, for my work to be slower than, you know, it has the potential to do by mm -hmm. not getting it. It's yeah, strange. Yeah, that's, that's a good example. You know, we finally just had to buy a new washer. We've been, it's probably been on its last legs for about four months. It literally sounds like um, there's a jet engine on our laundry room right now when it starts a, a spin cycle. And it's the bearing, I guess, in it, and which would cost basically as much as a, yeah. they quoted me at like 500 bucks to, to get it fixed. And so it started to make some more funny noise that don't sound as good. And so, but it was that, ah, oh, do I want to get this thing now? Because I mean, it still works. There's some unknown in the future, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, he talks about his seventh chapter or his seventh items and seventh chapter in the book. He says you need to stand up to bullies, stand up to the bullies. And, you know, that can come in multiple ways. But, I, you know, especially, you know, I think of it like the naysayers, people who are going to say, you know, oh, that'll never work. You shouldn't do that. Um, you know, it, you know, which is more, I think maybe the, the less extreme of bullying to where we also think, you know, there's the person that, you know, you're gonna have to stand up to him. You might get punched in the nose figuratively, literally, you know, but the fact is you still need to do it and do whatever it takes. Um, and I think that goes back to, you know, this idea of you know, the Christian idea of, you know, Christ calls us to, God calls us to take care of the orphans and widows. Because those are people that are highly exploitable. Yeah. And again, especially during this time frame, they're the ones that get forgotten. Yeah. And, you know, and there's there's a whole group, you know, not just orphans and widows, but just people that are marginalized by society, homeless population, people with, um, uh, you know, mental health um, problems, the elderly right now because they can't get out yeah. or they're highly recommended not to go out because of the potential for their, this virus to affect them worse, you know? And so, you know, it's, it's, you know, you see, you got to take a stand for that. And I know, you know, the churches here in Savannah right now have just been doing a phenomenal job, I think of, of trying to make sure that people are still getting fed, yeah. meals are being delivered, medicines are being picked up for people who can't go to the pharmacy, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, children are still getting their breakfasts and lunches that they normally would have gotten at school. And the church has been doing a big part of that. You know, um, he, he then talks about rising to the occasion and, you know, and again, I think that, that the first thing that came to my mind as I was preparing the notes for this one, Quinn was, you know, when you sort of called me out, you know, that's what I call it. But when you said, Hey, you ever thought about doing something like yeah. this, what we're doing right now, it took somebody else to sort of look at and say, all right, yeah, you have potential. So you need to go ahead and try this. And then taking that risk of saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it up a step because, yeah. you know, if we're not putting ourselves in situations to where we feel maybe a little ill-equipped, if we feel, you know, that, Hey, maybe I'm not completely ready for this, then we're not going to grow. Yeah, for sure. You know? Um, and so, you know, it's almost like looking at, all right, what's something I want to be, what's something I want to do and go, all right, I'm going to start doing it. It might not work right away. It might not be perfect, but I'm going to take that chance. I'm going to step up and do that, whatever yeah. it looks like. Um, the next one, give people hope. And especially now, right now, I mean, that's what the world needs is hope. Yeah. That's what I need on a daily basis. I think, you know, that's probably something everybody says right now when they wake up in the morning, they just need hope. Yeah. And, and, and he's talking literally just about, you know, 
this idea of we live in a terrible, you know, in a world that's really messed up and, you know, you should, you should go out of your way to give people hope. And that's going to look differently for a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. But, you know, the inverse of that is don't go out of your way or, or even, you know, maybe absent-minded of trying to take help away from people. Yeah. And that's mostly going to happen through our words. Yeah. Um, and again, obviously, you know, that that's, you know, if we look in the Bible, we look at what it talks about with that as far as, you know, how, how much harm our words can do um, and how we should be this beacon of hope. Yeah. That's what we have. You know. And so just figuring out how to do that, especially in times of social distancing and isolation, state of home orders, how do we give people hope? Don't turn on the news, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I've been checking it probably twice a day, and but it's the same stuff. Yeah. And, you know, more bickering between politicians, more cases, more, we don't know when the economy is gonna open, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, don't turn on the news. Um, and the last one he has is never ever quit. And, you know, that comes from something that, you know, in the SEALs, especially when they're going through their training and, you know, it's just don't quit. Whatever you do, don't quit. And, you know, and I can reflect that through some of the training that I went through, which was nowhere close to what a Navy SEAL went through. But they, when we went, um, when I went for my assessment to go into the 160th, you have to do a swim test. And I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fairly basic swim test, but it can still cause some anxiety and fear. But basically you've got, you, you know, a flight suit, boots, a flight helmet. They put a vest on you with, and there's some weight in the vest and they have you jump in the pool and you do some different types of treading water. Yeah. And, you know, I was told by somebody else, uh, he said, hey, you know, because I knew there was a swim test. It was no secret. And, you know, they, they, you know, he told me, he says, don't quit. And I go, but what if you don't quit? He says, if, if you drown, they'll pull you out and they'll yeah. revive you. But just yeah. don't quit. No matter what, don't quit. Yeah. And it's that idea. And you're like, wait, that just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, but in the sense of, you know, I was just thinking right now, I was reading another article just talking about how teenagers right now and just here in the United States and probably in other parts of the world too, with social, isolate, social isolation that they're having to go through, just the toll it's taking on their minds and their mental health, mm. you know, and, and, you know, we've talked about this before, but again, just in regards to other people who already either have started to go down that dark road or whatnot of this idea is, you know what? I'm just going to call it quits. Yeah. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know if we're ever going to come out of this epidemic. So I'm just going to take my own life, mm. check out, take these bottle of pills, drink this bottle of alcohol, whatever it might be. And which is the ultimate form of quitting. Yeah. And, you know, then to everybody out there, I think they should know, you know, no, don't quit. And, you know, that's probably the most important thing is, especially again, in this time that we have, you know. So those are the 10 things. Um, I'll put a link. I'll list those as well um, and put a link to the book. But man, it's a great book. Again, it's a small, maybe 150 pages. People can read it over, you know, a night, read one a day. But if anybody else has ever read it, I'd be interested to hear their thoughts on it as well. But, yeah. You know, so... But hey, that's what we got this week for Thriving on a Mission. And uh, we'll be back next week again with another episode. Yeah. Thanks, Quinn. No problem. We'll see you all next time. All right.